This presentation is a brief foray into the non-Western arts. We're going to look at Chinese art for a moment. Um, in your textbook on page 123, there's a reference to the Han Dynasty tradition of painting in China, which was fairly contemporary with the Roman era that we're studying. The Han Dynasty went from approximately 200 BC to approximately 200 AD. The example you see on this slide is also from the Han Dynasty. And there's a degree of life-likeness in this painting that is quite different from what we see in the Greek and Roman approach. In this photo, or in this painting, there's a little bear attacking the emperor, and you can see that one of his consorts is standing bravely by his side as they fend off the bear, but one consort is fleeing off to the left side of the picture. And there's a successful, I think, effort to capture the psychology of this, this very moment and the fluidity of the, of the fabric and the postures of the characters in the painting really give it a life-like, lively feeling. Here's a sculpture from the Han Dynasty, and we can see, again, a great difference between the Greco-Roman approach and this approach. Here, there's not a lot of effort given to making um, precise detail or anatomical correctness, but rather, again, a successful effort to show the motion, to show the moment is sort of capturing this dancer at a particular moment in the dance. It's as if the sculptor wanted to capture the life spirit of the subject, but not necessarily every literal detail of the subject. There is a slightly more literal tradition of painting. This is from a mural on the tomb of Li Zan from 706. And this would have been done by a hired painter. If we're talking about the role of the artist, this hired painter would not be held in especially high regard. He would just be considered a worker and painting would be his job. In this figural style of painting, it's very precise. They're very clear outlines, bright colors, but still rather lifelike and definitely showing the motions of the moment. You can see people's heads at different angles and their hands are making um, motions in this momentary capture. This example, however, is of landscape, landscape painting. And landscape painting provides another insight into the role of the artist because this style of painting would not have been practiced by a professional painter or an artisan. This would have been done by the literati, the scholars and the public officials of the, of the upper class. This kind of painting was meant to help the scholar or the official reflect. So while they might not have had the time and the ability to go live the life of a hermit in the woods and reflect by making a painting like this and depic depicting the vastness and the rhythm of nature, the painter would be able to reflect. And in fact, many times a painting would inspire a poem and they may write a poem. And actually this class of scholar officials we're expected to have four skills in order to really be considered educated. And those skills were all artistic. It was calligraphy, painting, poetry, and music. And this painting was one element of that. Here's another example that shows how important it was to capture the, the spirit of the subject. So here, there are, there are a number of details that aren't even painted onto the canvas. It's just suggested, but it's so successful at conveying the lightness and the jitteriness and the quickness of the motions that a finch would make, the delicacy, the, the smallness of their motions. And there's even one 
aspect that may be hard to see in this slide, but the eyes of these birds are made by a single drop of shiny lacquer, which just gives it that much more uh, lifelikeness and, and spirit. Here's one more example of landscape painting. You can sense the, the vastness here. You can also see atmospheric perspective. So in these Chinese landscapes, they did not necessarily use a vanishing point or linear perspective, but you can see the atmospheric perspective, how the foreground is more clearly drawn and more well-defined and it becomes more diffuse as it goes off into the distance. It almost invites you to walk into this painting um, and engage in that reflection. This slide I put in for contrast because part of why I think this unbroken, naturalistic, lifelike tradition of Chinese painting is so interesting is that it's so different from our Western tradition. Greco-Roman art was becoming ever more naturalistic, more realistic. But then with the fall of Rome, our culture and our artistic heritage was really disrupted by the Middle Ages. Coming out of the Middle Ages, the church had supremacy. And our artistic tradition, as you can see in this um, leaf from a missal, really was centered on the church. The church was the main patron of the arts, um, and many artists were, were doing their work on behalf of the church. So this is a beautiful piece of work, but it shares almost nothing with the Chinese pieces that we've been looking at. It does not capture the rhythm of nature. It's not trying to portray a single moment in time. It's trying to teach a story. You've got Christ on the cross. You have the Virgin Mary and St. John on either side of him. At the bottom, that small figure is Adam. And basically, there's a story being told. It's very stylized. It's artistically effective, but that effect is gotten through contrast and line and stylization rather than life-likeness. So this painting, or this um, leaf here, is from the 13th century, and the final slide in this presentation is from the very same time. This is called Early Autumn, and it's contemporary with this in France. So I just think that's a really um, interesting thing to observe the way those traditions developed at different times. This, I think, is a very beautiful painting, and it certainly captures a single moment. You can practically hear the chirping and buzzing of these little insects, and you can see the ephemerality of the moment and the lightness of these insects. You can see the diffuse light of autumn and the decaying leaves at the bottom of the painting. It's so effective at capturing a moment. Well, if you look at our tradition, capturing a moment is something that I would associate with photography. I'd also associate it with Impressionism. Impressionism is a late 19th century phenomena, phenomenon in our tradition. So it's very interesting to think about how the impulse to capture the spirit of a subject, the natural aspect of a subject, the ephemerality of a moment is the tradition in China. Yet in our culture, it was almost a rebellion, really, against what had been going on for centuries in Europe. 